This is kind of a special day, so to speak, that I just wanted to, oh, I don't know, take some time and talk about a few things and think about a few things, reflect on life and death. Because Memorial Day, they tell me, is a day that's dedicated to remembering servicemen and people that have either died or served their country. And in a lot of ways, I watch how over the years in my lifetime, different ways of enjoying the day, a holiday, as opposed to a holy day, but different ways that the holiday is expressed by the public and the media in general. As we as a nation have changed from our perspectives in a lot of different varieties and forms and formats. I know thinking back over my Memorial Day experiences, I remember laying in a VA hospital in Long Beach up in North Nine. And I remember that Memorial Day had come and I knew it was Memorial Day only because they had put out this paper. We had plastic trays and they were serving the food to me and they brought it to my bed, you know, and on it was this, you know, little paper, uh, what do they call those things? <laughs> now that I think about it, placemat. The placemat was a Memorial Day placemat and it had red, white, and blue, you know, and there was a little flag and a cupcake. And I remember that, you know, to this day. I was, oh, I don't know, I think I was 89 pounds at the time and I was dying and, you know, I remember looking at that Memorial Day, you know, cupcake and placemat and thinking, huh, it's Memorial Day. And it really didn't mean anything to me. You know, I didn't think about or have a visitation from AMBETS or American Legion. I remember the menu was great because it was like some, something different. I think we had like, you know, turkey and gravy or something, you know, something that wasn't quite normal, but it was still kind of hospital food. And it wasn't that good, especially back in the Vietnam era of the days, you know, and this was post Vietnam. And unfortunately, in my generation, Memorial Day wasn't celebrated the way it is today. You see, today is kind of like a rah, rah, re, re, you know, salute the flag and, you know, celebrate or, in some ways, honor patriotism as a high form of idealism. And in some ways, you know, I understand that, you know, I kind of maybe look at it a little differently than most people because I'm thankful for you know, what God has done, you know, in my life. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful that one day, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn so war anymore, but they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That they will not have war anymore. And I know in my thought process on Memorial Day, I kind of stay away from people because they always want to do all these big parades over, you know, those that went to war, you know, like World War One and Two and, you know, Korea and all the police actions around the world that aren't talked about, you know, and some of the things that we've done as a nation that aren't so positive, you know, like assassinations and things like that, you know, that probably most people don't want to talk about, but God saw and God sees and God judges. So sometimes, you know, I, I stay away from celebrating some of the whole holidays because I always look at it differently. You see, I kind of look at it from a perspective of what do I need to learn from this day that's called Memorial Day? And I think about it for me that, you know, I recognize those that have died, you know, and I think of Memorial as like, well, in memory, did those men that died for our country know Jesus? Because that's my first thought. My first reaction to Memorial Day is, God, I hope they knew Jesus. I hope they were saved, because if not, they're in hell. And 
that usually doesn't go over too well with people when they want to have picnics and barbecues, you know, and have hot dogs and put on hats and celebrate, you know, or maybe go to Arlington Cemetery or go to some place to remember 9-11. Like I hear this constant memorial of, oh, we've got to remember 9-11. Well, I was around for 9-11 and it didn't affect me at all. You know, I was a Christian and I thought, well, Lord, you know, it's the end times and it's one of those things that's going to happen, you know, and I prayed for the families and cared about what happened to the people that were unsaved that may have been in the towers, but other than that, I only remember, the only thing I remember about 9-11 was afterwards how religious people had gotten for a short period of time. They were all talking about God, where right before 9-11, People were talking about how mean and honoring New Yorkers were and how they cuss and swore and you know were the most ungodly people in the world. Then afterwards everybody loved New York, you know. Wow. I remember that very clearly. And then everybody was, you know, like putting on flags and the flag waving, you know, and my thought at the time after nine eleven was like, Ooh, flag waving is dangerous, you know, it's kinda like whenever you see a nation get patriotic or get uber patriotism usually right afterwards they go to war. Well, it wasn't too long and we did, you know. It kind of went into Iraq, you know, and all these other wars, you know. Afghanistan, and we blew it in Afghanistan again, but, you know, some people say we did good, you know. It's like, well, okay, you know, we did that in Iran too. We did good, you know, we had the Shah of Iran too, and we'll see what happens in Afghanistan, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, having come from Vietnam era, I kind of know what's coming. And I think that's what we should have learned from our memorial days is to remember and observe. You know, it's kind of two words that God said in the Bible about the Shabbat, about the Sabbath day. To remember and observe. You know, to tell these things to your children, to the generations that are to come of what happened before. You know, and I recognize that there is that desire to want to celebrate the country you're a part of, but I just don't feel like I'm really that much a part of the world anymore. I almost feel like I'm less an American and more a citizen of heaven. You know, a citizenship of heaven and not of this world, that my flesh, though it be born in Los Angeles, California, of all places, and is an American technically, it unfortunately is dying to that flesh and living after the things of the spirit and I don't really see you know celebrating some things patriotically as being things of the spirit oh sure I go along with it you know and I say yeah cool just like 4th of July yeah look at the fireworks yeah that's pretty cool but I recognize all days that God is in he's caused us to recognize that there is a time coming so soon that the end of all things is at hand and we should be sober-minded thinking about these things that Jesus said and the things that he did. And you know when I do that I remember one story that Jesus told about you know there was a disciple that came up to him and said you know I want to follow you but first let me go bury my father and he said let the dead bury the dead. Now that sounds pretty cruel, you know, and then some people use that as like maybe a simile or a metaphor and say, well, he didn't really mean that, you know, he was more about, you know, the guy was going to you know, use that as an excuse and so he was just confronting the excuse. Well, no. God says what he means and means what he says, so this guy was really going to go bury his father, you know, and burial in Jewish ways took a little bit longer than what you would normally think because you have to settle affairs and you have to make sure that things are taken care of in the estate, you know, and sometimes it took a little longer to bury the dead than what you think. Oh sure, they get into the ground pretty fast, but there's still the mourning process and that. And so, knowing that Jesus called his disciples and they got up and followed him, what he told to this particular man about let the dead bury the dead was the reality of many are called, but few are chosen. So I think about Memorial Day, you know, and it saddens me. It really bums me out. A lot of it makes me think about 
all those you see crosses and and uh, tombstones, you know, and you see Mug and Davids or Star Davids, you know, and you see all these different crescent moon, you know, and you see all these different emblems of the faith that they died in or was supposed to be a part of. And the thing that I find tragic is that I've been in the military and I know that not all men are Christians in the military. And so when I see how many thousands have died without Jesus, that bums me out. That really, pardon me, but kind of makes a whole different spin and understanding to this memorialization of souls that have wound up in hell. Now the celebration of those that have gone to heaven, I rejoice in. I am glad for those that God gave them a choice to do what he wanted them to do. And if he told them to go into the military and to serve their country, then God bless them. Or if they just did it out of their own draft, you know, because it was a law of the land. Or if they did it because they prayed about it and it was the right thing to do. Or they did it just because they needed a job. Or they did it just because, because those are good reasons. You know, God can use that which is seemingly carnal and work out something spiritual from it. And God bless them for that. You know, I mean, I don't see this whole idea of somehow putting my thanks to men who have protected me because I don't see that as my protection because God said, no, your protection isn't in the strength of arms, and it isn't in, you know, your men of war, and it isn't in your right arm, but it's in the Lord. You know, your your protection and strength comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from the military. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> any Christian knows that. All they got to do is study the scripture. Basic, real basic scripture, you know, is that my help comes from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who make his heaven and earth. You know, I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. You know, I mean... Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha was the epitome of where I'm at in my faith and life. He said, you know, Elisha's servant said, oh, no, 9-11, it's happened. Elisha, quick, we got to go do something. The, the Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming. You know, and sure enough, you know, just like in my day, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. Elisha looked at him and said, so? And... You know, his servant says, well, aren't you going to do something? And Elijah says, no. And the servant says, but, 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 but. And Elijah says, okay. God, open his eyes, show him. And sure enough, once the servant went and looked out, he saw the armies and the hosts all gathered about. But then, because God opened his eyes, he saw the angels standing behind that army, waiting with flaming swords to destroy that army. So you see, I don't I don't get off on some things that human philosophy and patriotic endeavors want to contradict what the scripture says. I don't quite go that far. I thank men for their service, but I pray for them to move on to learn something better than the art of war. You see, there's this whole mentality in the last days and this generation we live in that somehow the patriotic man is the one who serves his country by going to war. Where I think the patriot is really the person who's a missionary, who's willing to lay down his life, you know, for those that have no food, for those who are unclothed, for those who are naked and poor, for those who haven't heard the gospel. For those who are willing to work behind the scenes, accomplishing the purposes that God tells them to do. Now, you can tell me that, you know, in your service to God, if you decided, you know, that you sat down, you prayed about it, and God spoke to you and told you to go be an army man, God bless you, G.I. Joe. Go do it. Or if somehow, you know, you thought that you were one of the proud, the few, Semper Fi, as I understand, then 
God bless you. You know, we know the heaven's gates are guarded by the United States Marine Corps. I mean, after all, I was a Marine. <laughs> but you know, with all the corruption and all the destruction that I've seen caused by man, I think I'd rather follow the Son of Man, who is the Prince of Peace, than I'd follow the ways of war and then have to come out on a day and say, thank you for killing and being killed in the name of God? Country? Why? Protection? Defense? I don't think so. You see, a lot of people presume and assume that the Bible isn't quite as true as it really is. They make these statements about, well, I believe the Bible, that it says what it means, it means what it says, but then you ask them, do they live that out in their life? Well, no. You know, of course, I don't, I don't live like Elisha. That was one time event, only for Elisha. Really? Okay. So what did Jesus say? I mean, if we want to get to where our faith in reality is, you know, all I can say is, when you got a gun, are you witnessing to a person or are you putting them out of their misery by sending them to hell? Because you're not. When a person is dead, they're in heaven or they're in hell. And when it comes to eternity, my tenderness, my compassion, my mercy, the grace that's been extended to me by the love of God shed through the blood of His Son that He offered as a propitiation sacrifice for the sins of the whole world make me want to say to the uttermost and grab with the utmost urgency all those, even my enemies, that Jesus said I should love. Because the world compromises. Sometimes the religion of Christianity compromises by creating religious wars and even denying the words that Jesus said. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto myself. So, whenever I raise a banner, you know, I try to raise his banner over me, which is love, not war. When I think about Memorial Day, I try to think about those that died without God, so that I might spend the time in quality ways to develop a personal relationship not just with Jesus, but with those people who don't know Him. So I might share some type of encouragement in some way, lest by any means they might be saved from the disaster of their own ways. Because you see, the one thing that I keep seeing in front of me, whenever I watch parades or see military exercises or I see people exonerating or exonerating exemplifying the military as the greatest way to go I always look at the valley in the ghetto and I keep thinking wow up to a horse's bridle the valley will be filled with blood and there's only one way that can happen there's only one way that all that blood could suddenly fill up that valley if you've ever been to the ghetto if you get a chance go there to the valley of Jezreel or the valley of the ghetto where the battle of Armageddon is going to happen, it's one of the impossibilities that in a battle a field could be filled with blood unless, unless there were some other possibility of how that happens. Because you see, when Jesus comes riding in, you know, with us or whoever is in heaven at the time that God takes with him to right in as all of his saints it says that he comes with ten thousands of his saints you know to bring you know whatever and says he goes forth with the sword of his mouth you know which is the word of God and what people seem to think is like somehow that they they pick up these physical swords you know and they start playing you know Gunga Din you know and wiping each other out and stabbing each other and pretending like they're gonna be you know some kind of master swordsman so that when they come riding in, you know, they can kill people. Well, it doesn't work that way. You see, the Prince of Peace only has to say one word in the Valley of Miguel 
to stop all the war. And that one word is just simply peace, be still. The same way that he said to the storm, peace, be still, and the, the storm was calmed. Now some people, if they don't really experience God in ways that he's done in their lives, miraculously, in ways that go beyond even mentioning sometimes how he can take like a storm and go bingo and instantly in the twinkling of an eye cause the storm to stop not the kind of storm like you know where you say oh well he said peace be still and then the wind slowed down and then gradually the clouds parted and the sun came streaming through no the disciples were shocked out of their shorts they were dumbfounded that even the wind and the waves were at his command so when you have a storm if you've ever been to to uh, to uh, the Galil, you know, to Galilee, and on the, the Sea of Tiberias, no, on the, the Sea of Galilee, it's, you know, I've never been on it in a storm, but I've been on it on a day, you know, and it's a big body of water in some ways when you're one person. And if you're in a little boat, you know, like a fishing boat from those days, I mean, it's not too little, but, you know, it's a fishing boat, and you were an accomplished fisherman, and you're worried about being swamped and being, you know, like killed and crying out to God because you say, God, we, we perish. Well, I think they knew what they were talking about. And then, because they weren't subject to just being stupid, when the storm was gone, they didn't just make up some story. It was instantly gone. The same thing is true about the Prince of Peace when he comes. Because all he need do is release that which binds or holds together our cells because if you didn't know this but in the atomic subatomic structure we have within our atoms you know kind of this repelling thing where normally you see things that you know you would say like in a magnet let's, let's give you an example of what I mean a magnet when you put south to south repels each other or one end of it to one end of it it'll repel each other because the electromagnetic uh, currency, if you want to call it that, or molecules of the electrons that are moving at a certain rate within a frequency are repelling against each other because they, they conflict, they hit each other in ways that you can't see, but you can demonstrate it in a uh, spectrometer and other means of measuring the electromagnetic current that's going on. So if you put south to south, like any kid knows, it'll spin or it'll move away. Well, our atoms are held together in a way that doesn't make sense. It's contrary to, really, the physical law. And at one time, they used to say that there was atomic glue holding everything together. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. But the Bible says that he holds all things together. Well, when he doesn't hold all things together, it'll just poof, come apart. And there are a lot of people, including myself, or maybe a few people, who knows, that teach in the Valley of Miguel, Jesus only says one word. You know. Now, some Orthodox, religious, Jewish type people YHVH, Yud Hey Vav Hey. When he says the word I am, literally everybody in the Valley of Megiddo that's there, their flesh flies apart, and all that's left is their blood. And poof, it's like whew, instantaneous filling up. Suddenly it's lake blood. <laughs> Ooh, gruesome. Well, it may not be that he says I am, although we are told in Scripture that when he said I am, the servants fell backwards. You know, the, the guards that came to get him were thrown back. Because, I don't know if you realize this, but when he said, I am, he was using God's name. And, no, it's not that you can't use God's name. That's a Jewish myth. Sorry, the Orthodox like to say that, but rabbinical Judaism at the time of Jesus, as it was starting out to fight Hellenism, actually became more Hellenistic than anything they ever dreamed of worrying about and invented lots of things, you know, including this sacred name idea of 
oh, can't mention the name. Oh, God forbid. You know, it's like, no, nah, I'm sorry. That's a myth. It was to honor the name that the abbreviation is used without the consonants because most Hebrew doesn't have consonants. It's kind of obvious what the names are. If you learn Hebrew, you can try to say it without without consonants and you kind of come up with you know and you get closer and then all of a sudden you know you kind of realize by way of the conversation and the sentence structure it flows into it I mean it's kind of like in Spanish and other languages except English which is really not much of a language but it flows into what they the consonants really are although I'm told there are people that are making up their own consonants now but okay but the point being is that God will eliminate war for the last time at Megiddo. There will never be another war. Trust me. There will be a rebellion at the end of the millennium, but that rebellion will be instantly terminated by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because Satan will then be cast into the lake of fire. And when that happens, there will be people that are deceived and follow him into that. You know, and that's a sad thing because there must be something about him that is able to convince people to choose not to follow God. So, when I look at Memorial Day, I choose not to follow the way of the world. I choose to sit down and talk to God about what can I do on Memorial Day to inspire me to celebrate it in a way that would bring glory and honor to God Almighty and not to the person and individual and yet still honor them in a way that is holy and acceptable in God's sight. Because all things are lawful to me. I mean, I can go out and barbecue like the best of them. I could go party hardy, you know, kick back a six pack if I wanted to, you know, beer or whatever, you know, or I could go out and, you know, do jet skis, you know, and act like an American, you know, and go four wheeling, you know, and go mountain climbing, you know, and go hit the beach, you know, and go do the mountain, you know, and run like crazy and do all kinds of it activities. But Memorial Day makes me think soberly, seriously, about death. Because it's not about the end, as some presume, as we've talked about. But I think about eternal torment of a person that I'm looking at all these men that have gone to war and I know not all of them are saved. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that most of them probably aren't. And that makes me think of Memorial Day in a different way. It makes me consider that there is a necessity for the gospel to be preached and taught even on Memorial Day, especially with our families and friends that we gather together to have a picnic. I mean, if you know or if you knew that tomorrow your unsaved loved one would die, what would you do today? Would you just party anyways? Celebrate anyways? Or would you go to them and explain to them as humbly and as meekly as you can tomorrow you're going to die and when you die and close your eyes to this world you will open up in the spirit to a place you don't want to be because God will condemn you to the eternal lake of fire where he'll cast hell and Satan and all the angels that rebelled with him as well as those that have rejected Jesus Christ by not accepting him God help you because I want you to be saved I want you to know that Jesus is real and alive. High Memorial Day, like many other days, is often like that. I hear what people say. Oh, I watch what they do. I understand their perspective. I understand what they mean. I listen to what they tell me, but then I still have to sit down and I have to 
deal with the living God. I still sit down and I talk to Jesus. I still have to consider death and whether I need to be absorbed with taking all the time away from sharing Jesus and the gospel to do my own thing or to bury the dead or to celebrate the dead as though that were glorious because other people are doing it. I think of how people like to tell me sometimes when they feel convicted they'll say well you're beginning to sound like a Pharisee you know you, you, you just you're always out there about this Jesus thing you know you, you sound like you always want to talk about Jesus and I said yeah I do and if that's wrong then I will be called whatever you want to call me but one thing I won't be called is not talking about Jesus because I enjoy who he is and he talks to me if it wasn't for the fact that God does talk to me then I could ignore it and just make Christianity a religion but since Jesus is real and alive it's a little hard for me to ignore God when I know I will see him face to face and on this Memorial Day I hope you're realizing that that as you look out over whatever celebration you're having whether it's partying or looking at crosses or going to parades or doing something special or going to yard sales like maybe my wife and I will do and get some plants or something you need to take God with you because he is in you and if you're not saved you need to recognize that today is the day of salvation as it says in the provocation harden not your heart for this is the day that God may speak to you or this is the day that God may want you to speak to someone about Jesus on Memorial Day.